Welcome everybody. My name is Joseph Tepe and welcome to the second event of BC's AAPI Heritage Month celebration. Talking about the documentary film, The Delano Manongs and Filipino AX American Experiences. Um, so I wanna introduce to you, Marissa Oroy, a Filipino American director and producer. She has directed the doc doc documentary Seeks in America, which received an Emmy Award for Best Historical Program. And the, the Delano Manongs, Oroy is a co-founder of the production company Media Factory, a Fulbright scholar. Oroy was recently listed as one of the most, uh, one of the notable Asian Americans in er entertainment by the Center for Asian American Media and cited by BuzzFeed as one of the legendary Filipino Americans in the US. Wow. Cool stuff. <laughs> you know, Joseph, you don't hey. have to read through all okay. of that. That's just that's a lot. I'm almost just... done. I'm almost done. So, I got to um... give my praise due. I know it sounds weird and awkward, but you know, you got to take your flowers, right? <laughs> Joining okay. her. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like this, right? Okay. Almost done. <laughs> Joining her is Alex Edelo. Edelo. I love this already. President of the Delano <laughs> chapter of the Filipino American National Historic Society. Roger Gardino, a member of the Filipino community and the docent for FAH and S. Sorry, I've been talking for a long time. Uh, <laughs> who knew many of the Manongs and Alex Fabros, a retired professor of Asian American studies who grew up with the Manongs and also appeared in the documentary. Thank you guys. I I'm looking forward to hearing this. Thanks, you, Joseph. Okay, um, you, so Joseph. I will be kind of moderating the conversation this evening. Um, Marissa, we'd like to start with you. Um, what, what was the process like for you um, in creating this documentary? And, um, you know, once it was out and, and sort of viewed and received, uh, what, what kind of feelings did you have about work, sharing this work and the story with, with the general public? Oh, lots of lots of questions, Nicole. <laughs> I got to break it down. <laughs> Just go for it. Just go. We, we want to hear you, not me. <laughs> well, really, it was uh, it, it was Alex Fabros's article with uh, with Dan Gonzalez, uh, where they wrote a, uh, an article called "The Forgotten Heroes of the United Farm Workers," and that was really kind of the 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 first step of uh, reading that, and that was br brought to me by uh, Mona Lisa Yuchenko. Actually, she was the editor of Filipinas Magazine, this um, this uh, this magazine that really focused on Filipino stories here in the United States, and uh, and that was kind of the impetus of of beginning this. Uh, before that, I had started a, a, another documentary that uh, KVIE in Sacramento uh, had me produce, and it was my, the first time that anyone allowed me to talk about any kind of Filipino stories, Filipino American stories. And it sort of broke things open for me in terms of um, telling Filipino history, Filipino history in the United States. And oh, it got me really involved with the community, fundraising in the community, uh, connecting with people like Roger Gardiano, Alex Adilor, uh, with uh, so many people in the community. And they brought me their stories. They brought me their photographs, um, their tapes of, uh, of people like Larry Itliang. Um, I met the son. So it just kind of snowballed into getting all of these archival uh, materials from the community themselves, the stories. And um, it was really because of the community, community that I was able to put this together. My husband and I were able to put this together. Um, working with the community, um, did you, how do I want to say this? Um, you know, sometimes like stories that are deeply personal kind of take on a life that's much different than something that feels more like work. Um, working with the community, was that a different process for you than what you, how you would have typically approached um, creating a new documentary or any other type of media? Yeah, certainly. I, I mean, I went to I went to UC Berkeley's uh, School of Journalism, and so it was very much this expositional type of documentary that we learned how to do. 
uh, you know, voice of God, like here's you, you do your, your B roll footage, which is like the visuals and you have your interview and you sit people down and, and you can see Delano Monon is very much still in that, uh, that same kind of um, uh, mode of documentary film. Um, but w the personal part was the fact that I narrated it, um, that, that there was an affection towards the people who were in it, um, that, it, and I think you can, you can feel that in, in the end, that there, there is a personal connection to the story and, the, and, and, and the meaning to, of it to, to me, um, personally. And I just want to say that even though uh, um, he's not in the final piece, Roger Gaudiano, we interviewed a few times. And the problem was that his interview is very blue, if you know what I mean. I don't know if that, is that a, is that a term here in the United States? Blue? Yes. yes. Okay. Roger's I'll just leave it at that. So you'll, have to, you'll, you'll have to ask him for his stories with the monos. Roger. Um, <laughs> no, 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 it's not appropriate. They're not appropriate for now, for this talk. <laughs> um, maybe a more appropriate uh, a way to include you. What was, what was the process like for you being involved in, in a project like this? And, um, you know, before you were approached um, and interviewed by Marissa, were you able to ever share these types of stories in any other type of outlet? Oh, yeah. I, I, uh, I, I got introduced to it, uh, started in the mid eighties, late eighties. I had a group from Long Beach State and uh, UCLA, the Samahan. And they, uh, they came to Delano and, and wanting, because they, they took Asian American studies and they wanted to know about their culture, the strike and everything. And, um, and uh, surprisingly, I brought a uh, uh, Philip Barry Cruz, a, He's a friend of mine to, to speak, and they were just shocked. And Philip Barry Cruz is like a rock star because they have books on him. And they never thought that could happen, and I, I pulled it off. But, you know, I, I, uh, since then, I, I've got Cal, uh, UC systems, Cal State systems, junior colleges, high schools. And we do, if, if it wasn't for COVID, we'd probably do 12 of them this year. But, uh, and I enjoy doing it. I, I, one of my pet groups is from Stanford, and uh, there's about a dozen students or so, and they're, they're with alternative studies. Instead of going to Cancun, they come to Delano and learn about their history. And most of them are mm -hmm. mestizos, half, or they're from city, Filipinos in Omaha. I didn't think we had Filipinos in Omaha, Nebraska. But they, you know, and one was half Filipino, half Aborigine from Australia. So I, I get this mix, and but they all want to know their culture and the Filipino American experience, which is to them very important. And I, I wanna give them a sense that uh, we're, no, we're somebody. We contributed something really good in, in the grave strike because we improved a lot of uh, farm workers' lives, not only domestically, uh, nationwide, but worldwide. And you know, it started in 65. Alex. Um... As an historian, I guess both Alex, um, as, as scholars and as historians of, of Filipino history, um, do, you, do you feel like a sense of responsibility to pass this knowledge on? Um, and and you know, what are the, the ways that you have found in your experience um, telling stories and, and working with students that is the most effective way um, to get people invested in, in the narratives, in the history, in the contributions? Um, and, and continue it and, and help it move beyond Delano, beyond Kern County, beyond California. Which I'll Alex? Defer, I'll defer to you. <laughs> either one, I think you're both, you're both sort of scholars and historians here. So um, if either one of, or both of you would like to answer, um, it would be great to hear from you. I'll defer to Alex. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, uh, the, um, uh, it's really an easy story to tell. I mean, um, I started joining in with uh, Roger in, in, in conducting tours. And um, it's very easy to talk about the, the monuments. They, they know the struggles of, uh, of farm labor. 
you know, how difficult it was. It, 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 it isn't uh, a stretch to explain to them how rough it was, because they can imagine. And then to see them accomplish such a global uh, event, such as the Atlanta Grape Strike, and succeed at it uh, to some extent uh, uh, means mountains to them. You know, I've, um, I've gotten kids come, come after their visit, just tell me, you know, I'm, I'm gonna study uh, more about the Filipino uh, American stories. I'm gonna become a lawyer so, uh, so I can help other Filipinos out. So it's been, it's been inspiring uh, and it's, it's an easy story to tell. And um, one last thing before, uh, before uh, I pass on to uh, Dr. Fabros, um, I want to thank him for writing that article uh, about the Forgotten Heroes because uh, Roger and myself, we were children of Delano. We grew up in it. And we spent our whole adult life explaining to people that Filipinos started the whole strike. I was in college. Um, um, just last May, I was, I was in a uh, documentary uh, that, um, about the Asian Americans. Boom, I get a text message from a Mexican American friend of mine who, who grew up with us. And he texted me, he said, I didn't know that Filipinos started the grape strike. And this was last year, this is 2020. So uh, I wanna thank Alex for, for uh, um, writing the article. I wanna thank Marissa for, for the documentary. Now we don't have to, to struggle to remind everybody that, hey, we were here. We were, we were the first ones to walk out. Larry Itliong was the trained union organizer and leader that, that got uh, the ball rolling. Um, kudos to Cesar Chavez for, for, for elevating the, uh, the movement, but you now give kudos to, uh, to Larry and Mount Phillip for, uh, for instigating the whole thing. I, I grew up with uh, two men who I consider to be real historians of the Filipino American experience. One was Dolphine Cruz, the publisher of the Philippines Mail. And the other one was my father. And both those individuals could talk story. You ask them a question, and I get a dissertation from those people. In 1965, I participated in a series of strikes. First one was... Uh, the asparagus strike up in Gonzales, California, down, then down in Coachella Valley, and then Delano. And in between those strikes, I asked my father, did you guys ever strike before? He says, oh yeah, in the 1930s, 34, 36. And in fact, in 36, they had machine guns out there ready to shoot Filipinos on site. And I said, now you, you, you're kidding me. And then Delphine Cruz took me out to his garage and he showed me these newspapers. I went to 1936. And then to cross-reference him, I went over to Salinas, California. And then I went to some of the San Francisco newspapers for the same date. And they have machine guns pointed at Filipinos to force them to go back to work. But there's a story in, in 1940 that says that the Filipinos threatened to go on strike and the growers decided it's not worth it to go on strike with the Filipinos because they're going to be out there as long as it takes to win. They went ahead and gave them five cents an hour increase in pay. So they had become a very militant labor force in the Salinas Valley in California. And that was long before Itlion came along with the Delano Great Strike. All he was doing was carrying on a long tradition of Filipino labor activism in California, always striking for better wages, better working conditions, and better benefits. And all they did was tell their story. Um. Speaking about stories, I think um, one of the things I think when, especially when you come from a marginalized group is you learn your, his, you learn history through textbooks at school. Um, and the narrative is always talking about the big important events, the big famous people that everybody knows. Um, but through this process of, of telling the stories, all of you have done that in different ways. Um, what would you say to people that, you know, like about sort of like the micro histories, the social histories, the local histories, and how simple it is to do that type of work, um, and how 
it might be just as important as these big historical events that we read about in books. So like you said, you just hearing stories from your father, um, how do you encourage people to get those stories out of them, their elders themselves? Um, and, and would you let them know how important they are? When I was teaching Philippine American history at San Francisco State, the first project, the very first day, I wanted to have the students tell me their immigration story. Why and how did your parents come to America? That's their first mm -hmm. assignment. And then I asked them to go back two, maybe three, four generations back. So they could see how each generation suffered or overcame their their handicaps. And for many who are second or third generation Filipino here in the United States, going back to those two, three generations shows how maybe that person came to the States in 1910, 1920, and what they went through in life here. And then the second generation, how they carried on, and then their generation, what they're doing to carry on that heritage. So by forcing them to go back and in act, actually encourage them go back and talk to their parents, a conversation that most students do not want to have. They, uh, they learn about their heritage and their roots here in America and why they're here. And I encourage students, if you want to know about your history, talk to your parents. They're the ones who came here first. I'd like to add to that, Nicole. I, I do the same thing with my students as well, my film students. Um, at the, uh, I teach at the new school and I teach um, at, the, at Trinity College Dublin in, in Ireland. And um, I teach documentary film. And this last year of being in lockdown meant that everyone had to focus their documentaries on something close to them, uh, somebody accessible to them. And really it's the most important stories you can tell as a filmmaker are the stories of the people around you, of your families. And they're often the stories that we just take for granted because people are there next to you. And even as I say this, I realize I, I still haven't um, ever interviewed my mother. Uh, and, and I really like to do that, just to sit her down and ask her some of the very basic questions. And, I, and, and now that everyone's got a smartphone, everyone's capable of, of, of filming um, very easily and asking something like five questions of, of every family member they have, and learning, learning about where they came from, how, like what it was like for them to come, to come over here and, and about the, as Alex was saying, about their grandparents or their great grandparents. Um, there are certainly stories about my uh, great grandparents that I never found out about or asked more about and that history is kind of gone. And it's something that I very much regret. And it's very, it's very, it's something very easy to do. And I think that's an activist statement or activist move to, to film and honor your, your ancestors by, by interviewing <clears throat> your family. Uh, I you think know, a lot of people. Do, oh, go ahead, I, Alex. I, I gotta. I, yeah. I want to add something. You well, know, for uh, historians, mostly we, we concentrate on California. But when you look at the overall picture from the 1910s to about the 1930s, there are Filipinos all over the United States. And you can find articles showing uh, different colonies of Filipinos. For instance, in Florida in the 1930s, they had a group that went there to start farming. But the Ku Klux Klan uh, forced them out of Florida completely. You have incidences in 1942 where Filipinos with Japanese wives were trying to bring their Japanese wives and their their uh, children who were half Filipino, half Japanese, to a place other than the relocation camps, concentration camps. And you go and they say, no, we don't want you here. Uh, no, no, but I'm Filipino. My children are Filipino, but your wife's Japanese. So we get stories like that. We also have stories in the Midwest where there's attacks on Filipinos. But people don't look at that. They're always concentrating on California. I'm not, I'm not sure why that is, but I think for someone who wants to to, uh, to know about her history, you have to know more than the history that you have. In fonts, I'm going to throw out a, a theme of fonts, Filipino-American National Historical Society. 
you have all these organizations around the United States, they're growing. These chapters are conducting research in their own areas on, on, on Filipinos, which I think will end But many of them were professionals, not just farm workers. I pass it on to Roger. Roger. Well, yeah, um, you know, this thing about history, uh, and, and Alex says a lot of it's exercised in California. And, and I can understand why, because most of them were here. But the thing that they don't talk about the early Filipinos is that no one talks about where they lived. See, when they came in boatloads in the 1920s and 1930s, there were thousands of them. There weren't just one boatload. There's hundreds of boatloads. And they migrated to California. And because of miscegenation law and, uh, and the land laws and, and the discrimination, they forget to, to, to state the fact that most of the Filipinos lived in labor camps. They were stuck there not for one year, but for decades. And a lot of them died there. You know, and the, that's the reason we call them the forgotten monos. Because they, they slayed for the rich farm owners and growers, and they got nothing out of it. And, you know, that's the shame. And, you know, that's not brought out in history. And, and that's just how I feel about it. But a lot of monos, uh, you know, they, they died a, a, a pitiful death. Uh, they were alone, they were alone and, 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 and a lot of them died without family. So that's just, that's part of history because of <clears throat> the, the laws and stuff. I just uh, did something on Facebook a couple of weeks ago and I was doing some search and I found that in Salinas, California, right around 1920, that 1,100 Filipinos to say goodbye to one Filipino who himself because he loved objected to it. And so it's those little stories that I find while I'm doing my research that brings life to Filipinos. And yeah, I think um, I'm broke. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're having a little trouble with Alex's yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I audio. just want to add something. I just yeah. want to add something. Um, uh, right along um, what Marissa mentioned about, about talk to your grandparents and stuff like that, I have firsthand, and I tell the story to the tours, and they love it. But in my household, my mother, who was a first grade teacher in the Philippines, came over. She couldn't get a credential because she couldn't, she couldn't drive. Number one, number two, they, uh, she had to uh, work in the day and take the bus to uh, to Bakersfield for a Fresno State Extension to see if she can get a credential. She quit after a while. Uh, it was just too hard for her, and she uh, she had to focus on. On, on raising the two of us, my sister and me. Well, uh, even before the great strike, my mother sat down and wrote a letter to, to, uh, to the grower that, that they worked for. His name was Tony Zaninovich. He was one of the three brothers. Uh, she wrote a, a letter, handwritten it. I wish I had to copy that letter. But um, of course she told her friends and, uh, and, and all the other uh, uh, Pinais, the, the women were all nervous. Oh, you're going to get us fired. Because my mom wrote a letter uh, to the grower and said, and asked this question. Men and women were working side by side uh, through every job uh, there in the fields, except for two. One of them was girdling. It involves uh, being on your knees, using a special knife, and you cut a ring around the trunk of the grapes. It was too, uh, um, women were too weak uh, to, uh, to, to handle that. The other job was pruning, because it was, again, it required upper body strength. So she asked the question, why, why uh, uh, is it that we work side by side with their husbands, yet the men make $1.10 at the time, $1.10 an hour, and the women only make 95 cents? Okay, so fast forward one day out at work, um, there's a big, big, I was there, I, I was a kid. Uh, I, was, I was hanging out with my mom and dad because uh, uh, that, uh, there was no daycare. So I would go out to the fields with them and play. Well, one day there was a big cloud of dust and here was Tony Zinovich in his pickup truck. 
he drove up, he walked up with this letter in his hand. He, he stopped the crew and said, hey, I want to know the person who wrote this letter. Of course, my mom stepped out. The, the, the other manangs were pointing around. Oh, she did it. She wrote the letter, right? <laughs> and so my mom, my mom stepped, stepped forward and, uh, and Tony Zaninovich, bless his heart, he died uh, two years ago. Uh, he said, I showed the letter to my wife. She read the letter. She asked the same question of me. Why were the women being paid 15 cents less? So he said, I had no answer. So he said, starting the next pay period, I will pay women the same as men. So it's a little tiny story. <laughs> I didn't have to do much research because I was there. And, uh, and you know, uh, thousands of little stories like that um, are, are, are in our past and they need to be uh, retold. So thank you. Beautiful story. Um, like with this legacy of resilience and activism and, and self-advocacy, um, what do you think this current generation, especially um, considering you know, the rise of, of violence and discrimination against the Asian American community, um, does it, do you feel like that sort of legacy or those, those feelings or that, that <clears throat> culture is lost? And um, you know, how can the younger generation like use it to inspire, um, you know, their own self advocacy, their own resiliency? Um, how would you sort of give that advice or transfer sort of that that passion into um, you know making making things better for themselves and their community? I got an answer. Go ahead, uh, Roger. <laughs> uh, Alex and myself back in 1975. We got involved in, in Delano, and we, uh, we had a basketball league. And then the guy goes, hey, we're going to throw a statewide tournament in Delano. I go, let's throw something else. And I go, why don't we throw Barrio Fiesta, which is now Philippine weekend in Delano. It's been ongoing since 1975. Your point is, we didn't know it. I didn't know it, but it, 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 it blossomed a, a sense of pride amongst Filipinos because they, they have Black Week, Mexican Cinco de Mayo and all that. And we didn't have anything, but uh, we did it. We pulled it off. And then, and, and the, the, they had an all Filipino marching band. Uh, we, we had all these teams from throughout the, from San Diego to Stockton. We had a uh, lechon, which is a Filipino roasted pig uh, uh, cooked out in the park. And we had, uh, we brought Filipino culture. Danny Onosanto who taught Bruce Lee how to do the nunchucks. We had all that going. And then, then we brought the Bagong Dio, a new dawn, or new day from San Francisco. They were on PBS, and they're a professional Filipino dancing group. They came down. It, it was just what a we knocked out the city. Then we had a Filipino that wrote a that went to Cal State, uh, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. That wrote a play, and they performed it in uh, Cecil, Cecil Avenue Auditorium, and it, we pulled it off in six weeks, and uh, it, to this day, it's still going on except for COVID for last year because of COVID. Otherwise, so, you know, we triggered, uh, uh, we opened up, we, 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 you know, we, it, it brought up, and uh, the Filipinos, my people, they come out every summer to, to the festival. I mean, we don't have a few hundred, we get thousands that come. So it's, it's like, it's a good thing. And uh, it shows me that our people are dead, we're alive, and, and we wanna stay alive. <laughs> okay. Marissa, um, I have a question yeah. for you, kind of following up with, um, you know, just getting stories collected. Um, sometimes, you know, you teach it in universities all over the world, um, you know, and so, so I think sometimes we think of it as this formalized research process, but for somebody that's just sitting down with their parents or their grandparents, what is your advice to just get that conversation started um, that might feel awkward or uncomfortable or sort of out of nowhere? Um, you know, so what advice would you give to someone that does want to just sit down with their phone and collect the stories from their families? 
Well, I think everyone's used to doing selfie video or just filming in general with their smartphone. And so uh, mm -hmm. really to get people just very relaxed about it is to, I would almost say not to tell them that you're filming and get them while they're doing something uh, like cooking, for instance. Um, and, and they're making something that you want to preserve the recipe of, for instance, lumpia or pancit or adobo. And as they're making it, then start filming them. And, um, you know, there's people film all the time now so it's not nothing unusual and I think it's much easier now than ever to to film your family and get those stories out and you'll be amazed at at what kind of things come up and it's often just little itty bits something that might go on Instagram even or on Facebook or on TikTok and but if you gather enough of these these are this is gold to, to keep these these memories of the person and uh, to always have them. And I think you can start there. It doesn't have to be anything grand. You don't have to sit somebody down uh, like I would do, um, you know, in a with studio lights and a big HD camera or anything like that. Um, these these cameras on our phones are amazing, and the sound quality is amazing. And I think. Um, I think people are doing it now. Thank you so much for that advice. Um, one of the things that was mentioned earlier was that a lot of the Manongs did not have family. They were sort of just alone. Um, just kind of hearing their stories and knowing them personally, how did they create their own community? And like, how did maybe they redefine what family was? Um, and, and how important is that to you and in, in your memory? Keep it clean, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, do you uh, want to start? Uh, yeah, you know what? Uh, the, the, the Manongs attached themselves to families. We were a nuclear family, immigrated uh, from the Philippines. My sister, uh, six years older, my mom and my dad. My dad came earlier. But so we were a nuclear family and these Manongs would attach themselves to us, either through regional uh, uh, commonalities, maybe they came from the same uh, province uh, as we did, or my dad knew somebody who knew somebody. And so um, they would come attend our, our Christmas parties. They would, um, man, I, as a kid, I loved it. I mean, I had, I didn't have any other family in, the, in, in Delano, mind you, we were the, we were the first uh, uh, to immigrate here. So I had no uncles and aunts. They were all in the Philippines. Well, thank God for my moms because they, 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 were my, they were my uncles and my grandfathers. They bought me clothes for school. Uh, uh, they, were just, they were just so much fun. And they were, they were an integral part of my, of, of my growing up. I mean, I, I can name them big boy, Uncle Joe. You know, we, we, they were not, there, there was no attachment familiarly, but because, because they were part of our household. It was an extended household and it was wonderful. It was wonderful for, uh, for me, especially, like I said, since there was nobody else, uh, the, a family around us. So, and Roger can tell you more. Keep it clean, Roger. <laughs> uh, you know, Alex is right. Uh, um, uh, most Filipino families uh, ha had an uncle that they weren't related, they just called them uncle. And because the Manos were in need of a Filipino family, they missed it. Because, you know, imagine they're isolated in labor camps. People forget there was hundreds of labor camps from Arvin all the way to Fresno. And the reason I know is because we, we had a grocery store. We delivered the food, the rice, the 100-pound sack of Cal Rose rice to all the camps. We'd load up six, eight of them uh, sacks to all the camps. So I, 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 I walked in there. I saw how they lived, I saw, and we knew all the cooks, you know, we, we tasted all the, 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 the new, the modern Filipino-American cooking, because uh, in the islands, they didn't have carrots and peas, but they made them, they, they integrated that in Filipino cooking. But anyway, uh, we had, uh, I, okay, I, I'll keep it clean, but the, the Filipinos, uh, because Marissa made Little Manila, with Don Mabalun, uh, it, 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 what it, it indicated was 
that those young manos in the 20s and 30s needed a place to go. So they would go to dance clubs in town, you know, and uh, that was a big thing. I mean, it was really big. And then and they had fun, people made money, and it was an outlet. And because of, uh, you know, they, they were limited in their social life, believe me. But so they tried to enjoy what they could because uh, it, it wasn't like today, you could just go out and get a car and do whatever you want. Not then, you know, you didn't have all those amenities. You didn't have a car, you didn't have a good home. You couldn't, couldn't go on a date and say, come to my place. No way you're gonna take them to the camps. It's just outrageous. But uh, they accommodated, I mean, those guys persevered. I mean, they had guts just to, I mean, that was that one fellow, not one mano. There was a bunch of manos that lived the same, in the same situation. And they understood it, but they tried to make the best out of it. And I, I have to credit them for just having a lot of guts and for persevering. It's just, uh, you know, it's, an, uh, it's a tribute to our people, you know. And Roger? Yes. I just want to, I want to ask you and Alex because this is a this is something I don't know about Delano. Oh, it, so my uh, my grandpa and grandpa they're my great aunt and uncle, but I always call them grandpa and grandpa. Um, Felix and Felisa Roy. Yes, we, um, we know them well. They had I know you guys do. Um, they ha so my grandpa had a pool hall and there was some illegal gambling going on there too. Shout out to Joseph who said no. he had a, a relative. Oh, yeah. oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> maybe my I I'm, maybe I'm crossing that, the line I'm now too. To. Keep it clean, Marissa. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting. <laughs> PG, PG. Um, but uh, what were they? What well, were the social clubs? Were there dance halls in in Delano? Yes. Uh, they. Uh, uh, well, my my. Uh, I don't know the names of them, but the we had a design guy named. Maximo Bernas used to come to our house and he had an old car, looks like a one of those Al Capone four door low, low top. And uh, he was a bouncer, he was a, he, was a, he was a thug, but he was a nice guy. But anyway, he would tell me the stories about the gambling and the dance halls and who knows what else that went on. But- In but, Chinatown. Yes. And then, uh, and then, also in the Delano community, we had the social box, and that was a big thing. And they would have these uh, big bands, uh, the big band sounds. They tried to be, and they, 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 you know, the Filipino community was jumping back in the fifties and six. It was jumping. I mean, you know, I mean those, and then the, all the all the models of the camps went. And then when they had social box, if you were pretty, you made a lot of money, you know. But you know, it's it's. You you pay the to pay the dance with the girls, and then the girls some of the money goes to the club, and the rest of it goes to them. And it was a uh, it was clean, you know. Uh, and then, you know, but that that that, that's, that was an outlet, and and, and that was part of it. Uh, even before that, uh, I was talking to Professor Bagdai, he's an anthropologist, he came to Delano. Uh, the Filipinos actually had a, a baseball team, like kind of like the Chitlin Circus in the South. And they, 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 they that, was a, that was Pablo Paca. They had a team and they used to go all over California, play baseball. And you know, the, these are some of the history that is buried. But uh, he, Pablo Paca told us himself that they did that. So, you know, th those are little tidbits of history that people forget. And you know, uh, he started a boxing club in Chinatown, probably with your, with your grandpa uh, Felix Arroyo, Arroy, and uh, and and because Johnny Johnny Espinosa, my Mexican buddy, passed away. Uh, he used to say that uh, your your Manu Arroy, uh, uh, Felix used to get up in the morning, and he was in his thirties. He was shadow box and, and run around the block shadow boxing, you know. And, and these are kind of stories that just you know they tickle me that our people, you know, were still cool, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've been you having fun doing research. Oh. I'm here at the right. Blind Center uh, learning how to work with technology so I can become productive again. And uh, so I've been going through a lot of the 
and looking specifically for Filipino items. And it's kind of interesting that uh, <laughs> that they do mention dance halls, and these are these are uh, movable dance halls. They follow the the Filipino workers from camp to camp, so they go from town to town. So when the Filipinos are finished in one area, the Filipinos move up, let's say, from Delano up to Fresno. These uh, these vices would then pack up from Delano and head north to Fresno, set up, and then the Filipinos would, would go there, and they would proceed to either dance and what have you. Back in the 1920s, during the age of prohibition, the Filipinos were uh, were distilling whiskey. And <laughs> They have stories of bootleggers and gangster Filipinos with, with machine guns. Uh, I guess emulating the uh, East Coast gangs. <laughs> well, you know, I want to add to that. We said we've lost because we didn't get a chance to talk to these models. Well, I want to add to the thanks, so, Alex. You know, besides the booze and all that, you know, we had to get snow a sabung. That's uh, chicken fighting, you yeah. know, uh, fighting cocks. And that was going on all the time. I mean, that, that this is a regular occurrence. Uh, the reason I know is the butcher at the, my, my dad's store, the, the, the Filipinos, even well, white guys and Mexican guys, said, where's, the, where's the chicken fights? And he would be like the underground uh, information. And he would tell him, go down Avenue 6, make a left on Road 91 or 92, and uh, go down two blocks to see a camp, go in there, and there's, there's a chicken fight. And then, you know, and then they were always afraid of getting raided, you know, by the Kern County Sheriff, which they did. And some of them got caught. I can add to that. Let me add to that. <laughs> Alex, let me add to that. Uh, the, the sheriffs and deputies in Monterey County provided protection for the Filipino uh, sabongs. <laughs> and so if there's a raid coming, uh, the sheriff knew all about it, and he'd send them to the wrong camp. But I want to add some stories about the Philippines, especially uh, when, you, when you talk about dance halls and everything else. Sometimes the moderns would tell me that their girlfriend's coming to visit, and I knew something was up. They would say, <laughs> Junior, the next three days off, go back home to visit your parents. Here's $25. Uh, take my Chevy and just go. Come back uh, Monday morning, 4 o'clock. And uh, those guys were... <laughs> a lot nicer on Monday morning than they were on Friday, but there, there's a there's a lot of instances where, and, and there's a, there's this myth going around that Filipino women were prohibited from coming to the United States. That the reason we had that high ratio of 15, 16, 17 to one on the bachelor side wasn't because the women were prohibited from coming to the United States. It was because the men had every intention of going back to the Philippines. They were coming to the United States to earn that part of it at the end of the rainbow and then go back to the Philippines, buying a couple of hectares of land, one out of mouth, and getting married. And so they'd always had this intention of returning to the Philippines and marrying the girl that they left behind. That's the reason we have such a high ratio of 17 to 1, because they left their girlfriends behind, but they were going to come back with a whole pot of money. But when they got to Hawaii, they discovered that there was, it was difficult to save money, especially when the farmers were using the you know, to undercut wages of other groups. So, so eventually, the Filipinos were making less and less money, and so you have that exclusion of labor strikes in 34 and 36 in 1938 39 the u.s senate held hearings white growers in california were holding to destroy their union and once that hearing was held in 1939 and 1940 the filipino labor came back with a bang and basically threatened to shut down agriculture in california unless the growers came across with the demands they made and the growers caved in. This is all part of research that I've just started doing here at the Blind Center using the, the new technology because I go through and it reads documents to me and I listen to the stories and I'm reading these stories and listening. And I found hundreds of, of new stories that I had not heard about. 
That's all because of this new technology for blind people. Thank you. Alex, Thank just you. so you know, your Wi-Fi is coming in and out. I, I, I apologize. I'm here at the hospital, and we have really lousy Wi-Fi. <laughs> So we have about 10 minutes left. Um, if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question or maybe prompt a, a new story, um, please feel free to um, you know, type that out in the Q&A box and we'll make sure that all the panelists get to it. Yes, Roger. Uh, I, 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 I wanna thank the, the educational system of California. I don't know how the other states do it, but what was instigated in the late 60s and early 70s, it started out as the Asian, Asian American Pacific Alliances. Now uh, uh, it's developed into Asian studies all over at, at uh, you know, University of Cal, uh, Cal State Systems. And, uh, and they got their own Asian studies department. Uh, the reason I know is because they keep sending me those tour groups. <laughs> <laughs> and they're getting bigger and the kids are, and the, and, you know, the kids are more interested. And I'm glad they did that because without that, they would be Filipinos, uh, American born, who are kind of lost without an identity, you know, because they're in a new country, a new land. It's, uh, and they, they, what we do here is give, we give them a sense of pride when they come on tour. We, we, we tell them, you stand for something. You stand for something that we did. Though. What Larry Leon and Alex Veracruz, I mean, Philip Veracruz and uh, Philip Velasco and them, they did something that that was good, was positive for society. And that's what that's the kind of message I want to leave for those students. And that, you know, uh, that we, you know, we care that, you know, we're, you're, you're just more than a Filipino. Thank you, Roger. That was a beautiful message. Um, we do have a, a historical question here in the chat. Um, were there any Zoot Suit riots that you know of in the Central Valley? Um, we, we all kind of hear about the ones that happened um, in LA, but um, was, any, was there any sort there of were... conflict like that? Go ahead, Alex. There were really no uh, Zoot Suit riots in the Central Valley or in uh, outside of Los Angeles. Well, oh, I think uh, we lost him. Oh. Anyway, in, in terms of gangs and stuff, uh, uh, back then uh, there was a riff. Uh, we used to get city boys out of San Francisco. They used to come down during picking season, harvest season to make extra money. There were a bunch of, you know, they wore black, they were like, you know, they wore Beatles stuff, you know, like black shoes, tight pants. And they had Elvis Presley, Huera, the pompadour. And, you know, and the locals, the mestizos hated them because they thought they were better than us. And, you know, I'm Filipino, I was born there, but I was raised here. And, uh, you know, they got in some mean fights because, you know, they're city boys and they thought they were hot stuff. And the, the Delano locals or mestizos are, were twice as big and huge, would say, you, you, want, you, you want some action? We'll give you some action. But, uh, but that was, the, and then we, we, when we had the, when we developed the Philippine American Basket, Filipino Athletic Basketball League, we had a conflict in town between the, the recent arrivals, the mestizos and the purebloods. And it was, Alex knows the whole history, but we had to tame those boys down because they were at each other's necks. But you know what? Now, 40 years later, you know, Noel would say, oh, Roger, uh, this is my grandson, uh, Joey. Uh, he's a good basketball player now. I said, hey, thanks, Noel. You're a good guy. But back when he start, first started out, it wasn't like that. <laughs> Just a good example of what happens when you blend and we mesh, you know, our backgrounds together, and it, it, it happens. Any other questions? 
Also, there's an article that was written by Anita uh, Bautista, who's from, she's a Thons member in Stockton, and she wrote something about Zoot Suits. And uh, her, she, she, she posits that, that Filipinos had something to do with the uh, creation of the Zoot Suit as well, that it is not entirely Latino, yeah. but I think you could probably spend like a couple hours uh, and <laughs> get into fights over that. <laughs> and um, Marissa, can you see the question that Andrew asked in the chat? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, yeah. It, it, how to speak about Don. Um, so Don, Don Mabalan was uh, absolutely instrumental in getting this history, the Filipino American history out to so many of us in, in, uh, in the United States um, from her books, but also just in speaking. And um, it, she is the heart of the, the first Filipino American documentary I, I, I did called um, Little Manila, Filipinos in California's Heartland, which was about the Filipino Americans in Stockton for the most part and and the history of her family is from there and as a professor at San Francisco State University there's so many people that she touched uh, with her work um, and including Journey for Justice which is a book that came out after her death uh, with Gail Romasanta the, the co her co-author and uh, we, we're at such a loss because of because she's she's gone uh, and hopefully all of us doing this work in, in promoting the Filipino American uh, history and, and stories, um, we, we've, we're all inspired by her still to this day. I want to share a Don Mabalan story. <clears throat> um, I got a phone call from Roger in April, 2015. And uh, I just put in a request to, uh, to, to, to create the Delena chapter of Fonz back in February. So I was excited to tell Roger, hey, Roger, you know, I, I, I want to organize uh, uh, this Delena chapter. And then he tells me the story. He, he gets a phone call from Don Mabalo. He says that, uh, you know, this is the 50th anniversary of the grape strike. And he said uh, she'd already gotten um, uh, an invitation for, uh, for the Chavez Foundation's big event in September, right? And she, she told Roger and me, he says, you know, that's great and wonderful, but I think we need to put one on for the Filipino side. So she was the one who, who got Roger and me motivated. So, okay, we've got the vehicle, we've got the Fonz Delano uh, being organized. We were chaptered in June and three weeks, three months later, we organized a three day event in Delano uh, with, with a bunch of people. Marissa was there. Um, uh, Don and her, yeah, Donna her and her, uh, um, a UC Davis cohort, uh, Robin Rodriguez, were very in instrumental in organizing, putting it together. They, they brought Alex Fabros down. Uh, they brought Gil Padilla down. I mean, it, it was a wonderful, wonderful event, but it took Don Mabalon to kind of to kind of goad us into doing this. Because uh, we, we, had, we had no notion, we had no, no uh, I guess, uh, no idea how to organize something like that. Uh, until Don says, we'll provide the speakers, you, you get us the, the sites and we'll put it together. And so I owe a lot to, uh, uh, to Don Mabala as far as uh, getting that bold step of 50th anniversary celebration together, so. I just want to say one more thing about that bold step uh, event as well. And I'm just trying to remember his name because it's just escaped me now. But one of the young Filipino American activists who came down for that event, um, he stayed here in Bakersfield uh, with at my mom's house. A group of them did so that they could attend the event and have a place to uh, stay for free. And uh, he is the person who first nominated the name Delano Manong's for the park in San Jose, uh, California. Oh, and so now um, the city council voted it in, Parks and Rec voted it in, and the city council voted it in. And so we, we have a Delano Manong's Park in San Jose, California because of that event, Bold Step, and because of this young man. Wow. 
I'd like to add one last thing here, okay? We get a lot of students who say, uh, we want to make change happen, but, they, but they're afraid to make change happen. In 1968, a group of young Filipinos met in my father's home down in Salinas, and they're part of PACE, Filipino American Collegiate Endeavor. Those young Filipinos were aged 17 and 18. In the fall of 1968, they went on strike at San Francisco State and they made change happen. It was young people who made change happen that enabled us to have Asian American studies as we know it today through most of our campuses. So I tell the young people, if you want to make change happen, don't wait for the elders to do it because we're tired. We've already done our bit. It's up to you to make change happen because you know the direction that you want to go. And it might not be the direction I want to go, but it's your direction and it's your choice. And you've got to make the changes, not me. Well said, Alex. Thank you so much. That is a very powerful message to end on. Um, Thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much for your time, for your stories. Um, I, I think I can speak for everyone here that we really enjoyed listening to you reminisce and sharing um, all that you have experienced in your life. Um, thank you to Andrew for putting this on. Thank you for to Joseph for the um, introduction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank you.